All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Professor Barry here. Uh, this is week one, and we are off and running. So just kind of like a couple things, and then we'll kind of get started with uh, some lecture content for the week. Uh, make sure you complete the attendance requirement by this Wednesday at 11.59 p.m., or else you, you will get booted from the class. Just kind of institutional kind of process and requirement. Um, chapter one, chapter two, quizzes over those two chapters due by this Sunday uh, by 11.59 p.m. They have to be completed by then, so if you started it 10 minutes before midnight, it will finish you up automatically at 11.59 or at midnight. Save it and you will be locked out. So make sure you get it done before then. Uh, the quiz time, um, I can't remember what I left at 20, 30 minutes. Kind of enough for you if you've read the material, taken some notes, highlighted things, you have the opportunity to go back over your information, all good. Uh, the quizzes are designed to engage you in the reading, to reinforce certain main themes, ideas, to make sure you're exposed to kind of the content. Uh, as I mentioned before, the more prep you do for the quizzes, the more you'll be set for the midterm and the final exam, which are both essay style, um, you know, exams to kind of demonstrate your knowledge and your uh, perspective uh, through writing. Um, and then this week, uh, video lecture. So there's a document under week one folder about video lecture summary and reflections requirements. Basically, take four points or issues that are talked about um, during this lecture, kind of talk about them, spend 75 to 125 points summarizing, explaining, providing examples, illustrations. Uh, it's just demonstrated that, demonstrating that you are, you are understanding the material and also are engaged in it. Um, and then respond to one of the questions that I pose. So I will pose a question in here somewhere uh, and respond to that question. Um, I don't have a specific you know, amount of words you need for that, kind of responding to that question. You're gonna love this, but just enough Respond deep in, you know, with enough information to demonstrate that you've engaged with the material and that you understand it. So I'm, I don't know. I imagine somewhere between 100 and 300 words, depending on the question and the week and that kind of thing. And that's due this Sunday via Turnitin and Blackboard. If you ever run into a problem with Turnitin, like get ready to submit, it doesn't work, uh, drop me an email with the document to make sure you don't lose points. And then we have the group wiki for the week. And the group wiki, you're going to be in a group, same group for the first half of the term, then we're going to switch it up to the second half of the term, you'll be different group members. Uh, two different articles, Geography of Bliss, World Happiness, both of those articles are in Blackboard underneath supplemental articles. I may have put them in week one folder, I don't remember uh, if I did or not. But anyway, uh, read those articles, pretty short, pretty sweet, and basically look over the assignment for the group wiki. Um, and once again, I mentioned this lab for the intro, sort of intro overview of the course. Uh, you have your post due by Thursday, then between Thursday and Sunday, go into each of the different group members, uh, provide some reflection and response to their information. What I'm looking for there is not only like, hey, great job, but also a way to demonstrate your own knowledge and your, your, um, your knowledge, your application, your understanding of the material. So provide some meat. So, so provide some depth of information. Um, that's an important part. So connect with each other also. Uh, send each other questions. Um, you know, use it as a place to hopefully build a little bit of community. That's the idea. Okay, so let's go into the chapter content. I'm gonna share my screen. I'll kind of go back and forth. Um, try to keep, the, keep this like 25 minutes, something like that. Anyway, between 20 and 40 minutes, but we've already occupied some time. Uh, but I, the goal is just to provide you sort of some major stopping points along the way of knowledge of sociology. And especially this first week is we are exploring kind of what is sociology and kind of main ideas, main perspectives and that kind of thing. Okay, so, whoa, here we go. So it's kind of like, I don't know, just kind of an image, like I had this idea of lab grown insect meat. It's, it just, a lot of sociological stuff that we could be thinking about. One is, you know, the meaning that we attach to food. The idea of eating insects is a learned thing. So we got to kind of, you know, from that perspective, we'll talk about from interactionism, this idea of like, a, you know, how we think about the world, how we think about things, 
the ways, the meaning that we have signed things is not automatic, it's not natural. It's a reflection of culture, our place within society. Um, and so, you know, part of this sort of lab grown meat, it's an expression you can kind of get into a lot of things about culture, history, meaning, understanding. We can also look at things like about our, our values that we have in terms of the environment, changing values, technology, um, to be able to do this kind of stuff as well. Um, mass scale globalization to be able to produce this food and distribute it at a mass level. There's a lot of different things that we can kind of explore uh, with that. I like this, this other one here, racist history shows why Oregon is, is still so white. So to understand, you know, to understand Oregon, to understand sort of racial composition and demographics of Oregon, we have to go back a long way in history to understand, um, you know, the Native Americans here in Oregon. Uh, before settlers, uh, colonization sort of moving west, um, sort of exclusion laws in terms of African Americans, uh, you know, uh, and, and this history is deeply entrenched in Oregon. Um, it's also related to, I think, you know, a, an element within Oregon of white, white supremacy and white nationalism. There's an element of that within Oregon as well, and that's kind of like a lot of historical roots. Part of Sociology is kind of poking around, trying to understand today, we have to go back into the past. Um, and the more we understand the past, the better we understand the present. But we're looking at the past with the lens of trying to understand elements about things that are going on in communities and society. And then we're also looking at more individual level things. So let's continue on our journey of some sociological stuff. Okay, so a lot of different social sciences, right? You have anthropology. I encourage you to take a cultural anthropology class. History is so important in terms of understanding uh, history of the United States, history of the world, history, you know, recent history, uh, you know, sort of ancient history. Uh, economics, an important sort of field to sort of understand a lens on human behavior um, and sort of look at the world through a different lens. Geography, the importance of place. Uh, the importance of place, physical landscape uh, shapes our experience, right? Um, so think about geography. There's a lot of interplay between geography uh, and sociology. Psychology has a range, right? Social psychology gets a little bit more close to sociology um, because it starts to deal with the individuals and groups and the influence of society on individuals and groups themselves. Psychology also gets into the neurological level, neuro developmental, uh, these different areas of psychology. So kindred spirits with psychology, but significantly different between psych and social. And that'll become more apparent as we get further into the course. And then sociology, dealing with human behavior, but we're looking at patterns of behavior, looking at culture, institutions, man, criminology, deviance, family, all these different institutions. Sociology has a unique vantage point of looking at society. Um, we're looking at the interaction between individual and social structure. Some of our theories focus on social structure, that's functionalism and conflict theory, and then more the more micro level interactionism. Although it gets a little bit tricky because interactionism actually kind of can move a little bit further in terms of the macro level. But for now, that's kind of the general kind of idea uh, in terms of, of, of sociology. Kind of a couple different things to think about. Uh, just this is kind of fascinating to me. So if you look here, this is the percent of society that was rural back in 1790, 95% of the United States. Um, and of course, this is predominantly east of the Mississippi River. Um, and just sort of look at the population size, total population, 4 million people. So now it's kind of keep on, okay, every 30 years, right? We're kind of going by 30 years. And just look at this major transformation that's gone on. We are predominantly urban now, right? So our society has shifted in significant ways. And tools of sociology help us to think about some of the growing pains that go along with that, some of the challenges, and then how do we create landscapes that help us achieve sort of our democratic principles of equality of opportunity, freedom, liberty, these kind of things that we cherish and we hold as super important. So not only, you know, just sort of thinking about sort of that transition from rural to urban, but also think about, man, it's one thing to run a country of 4 million people, run a country of 50 million people. Here we go, 1940, we 
we have 130 million people. So probably like from about 1950, it's, it's you know, we've doubled in size over, you know, course of 70 years. And just to think about that and, and to appreciate that, that our population has doubled in 70 years. And are we going to have some growing pains? Yeah, that's a lot of change in a short amount of time. Um, and hopefully, you know, we can use our tools of sociology to understand that. I include this video, this uh, slide here, just to kind of, um, kind of profile a couple of different things. In Chicago, a place called The Whole House. Um, I was actually there last spring or two years ago spring. Um, kind of went through The Whole House there, you know, outside of University of Chicago. Jane Addams, the first female winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. And her and Ellen Gates star opened up The Whole House. And basically The Whole House was demonstrates, illustrates sort of the idea of sociology, a public sociology. And that is the idea they built, you know, this is a time period of a lot of immigration in Chicago, major transformation in terms of work, a lot of poverty, a lot of health problems, sanitation, there was a lack of, uh, lack of structure in place um, to make sure that people's lives were being protected, that they were living environments that were promoting health and well-being. So you had a lot of inequities. Um, you had a lot of challenges that were going on in terms of uh, the welfare and the safety of particular vulnerable populations, people of the working class, poor working class, and um, immigrants. And what the whole house was, the idea was to be a place where, uh, you know, where Jane Addams and Ellen Gates Starr were advocates to identify problems that were going on with these members of the community, to move away from blaming them for, let's say, you know, health problems, say, okay, it's because they're poor, you know, some people may view the uh, individuals as they're just bad habits, right? That's why they're getting sick, is because they're just bad, they're immigrants. You know, they, you know, just sort of putting all this sort of stuff onto the, onto the individual versus thinking about, well, maybe it's an issue of public sanitation. Like that's what's driving some of these health crises. It's not individual bad morals and bad values, but rather things that are going on in the environment. So Jane Addams was an advocate. She was an advocate for moving us to thinking about policies and structures that are going on in the community. One of the unique things about the whole house, one thing that I really appreciated is that since it was near the University of Chicago, the idea was to take the students from the University of Chicago and have them work and live at the settlement houses. Um, and the idea would be that they would gain access and understanding and develop empathy by working with and being with these individuals who are working and struggling to make it in Chicago during that particular time period. Um, so it was a place of building bridges, developing understanding. Um, and I think we need that so much because we can get into a lot of misunderstanding when we don't know individuals of different demographics and different groups. So the importance of understanding each other is, is critical to de developing a healthy society, one that's built on mutual respect and mutual regard. Uh, if we're not connected, uh, it's easy to um, displace a lot of fear, anxiety onto particularly vulnerable groups. Um, socio sociology is a systematic study of society. That's by definition. Uh, we look at the interrelationship between individuals and society look at the context, historical context, cultural context, economic context, and basically our goal is to try to understand what's going on and if necessary, provide a vision of change. C. Wright Mills, The Sociological Imagination, um, I encourage you in that supplemental readings is a sociological imagination reading, um, pretty short, uh, but it's a, you know, it's a kind of a seminal piece in sociology, of reading about sociological imagination. And what you know, this, Columbia, this Columbia University professor kind of went after is highlighted the importance of connecting our personal biography to history. So one way of thinking about sociology and the value of sociology is that if I understand, um, I understand to understand my own biography of who I am, self-identity. I mean, to, to understand who, who an individual is as a person, we have to understand history and how history has shaped sort of the ways in which a person thinks, knows, does, 
So can we connect biography and history? So from a personal level, the more I understand history, the more I can appreciate kind of my own life. Uh, also gonna, can better understand the lives of others of different experiences. So we connect personal biography and history is an important element of the sociological imagination. Um, also an important part of the sociological imagination is this distinction between private troubles and public issues. He uses the example, Mills does, that 10,000 people are unemployed, that's a private trouble. Or no, <laughs> if a, a person is unemployed, that's a private trouble. If 10,000 people are unemployed, it's a public issue, right? So if we look at COVID-19 and we look at racial demographics of who's most vulnerable to, um, to both contracting COVID as well as uh, fatality rates, African-Americans, people of color, communities of color, these are the patterns where it's more, where more likely. That's a public issue. It's no longer a private trouble of just those individuals, but rather that's a public issue. If we look at criminal justice um, inequities in the criminal justice system, those are public issues that we have to address. Uh, those are, aren't, you know, either a bad criminal or a bad police officer. These are structural issues that are related to culture as well. These are public issues that demand um, our attention. So it moves us away from the individual to basically structure. Neither life of an individual nor the history of a society can be understood without understanding both. And I think that's kind of a critical kind of sort of an idea. Okay, so the value of the sociological imagination is that we humanize ourselves. Uh, we, we move away from demonizing, marginalizing, we move towards understanding. I'd a, I would argue too that, or offer the idea, we don't want to over align ourselves with individuals and fight for individuals necessarily just because, you know, for the sake of doing that. It's we're trying to understand um, different groups, individuals, their human experience. And I tell you, man, this is a long, lifelong journey and a difficult one to try to humanize groups that have been dehumanized. Um, you know, for example, looking at undocumented workers, um, individuals without papers to work, that is a group, you know, that there's a lot of baggage placed on that particular group. You can still take, you know, you can debate policies regarding immigration but the way we de have dehumanized sometimes that politicians, community members dehumanize these individuals lead us to misunderstanding. And it comes from a place of lack of knowledge and lack of understanding. Um, again, that's not about advocating for any particular policy, but I think you know, we start to um, neglect understanding social forces, we dehumanize others. Um, it helps to put us in, you know, ourselves in context um, looking at, for example, my own self, looking at myself in terms of a white, uh, of a white male. You know, if I can understand my own skin color, it's giving me different experiences. I mean, that's an important part of understanding white privilege. It's understand, understanding my own identity in terms of racial identity and potentially the experience of others. Puts ourselves in check to make sure that we don't have irrational judgments or minimize irrational judgments and humanizes others. Um, I don't know, this is like the sociological imagination, thinking about, <laughs> I kind of find it fascinating that 96% of students in dental hygiene programs are female. And just like, these are great occupations, great occupations with, with high wages uh, and great working conditions. And it begs the question, what are the social forces that are going on that are shaping um, that outcome? This is a great opportunity. This is a great, great career to explore. Um, so a lot of gender socialization stuff going on there. A lot of things that are happening that are shaping that. That's not only individual choice, but it's individual within context. Here we have a look at a number of women CEOs, you know, women CEOs, Fortune 500 companies over time. And we just look at, wow, the, the, the small number. And then if we look at women of color who are CEOs, it even gets smaller. So that becomes, kind of like a lot of social forces going on there. Um, okay, so fast, I'm gonna go through this pretty fast. In sociology, we're looking at for patterns of behavior. So here we're looking at, this is like just like coffee consumption. I wonder what it is like, you know, regionally, state by state in the United States. So we're looking at patterns. We're not gonna look at the individuals. You can always say, well, you know, that doesn't apply to me. You know, looking at a pattern is something. Well, you know, it's not meant to apply to everyone. It's just a pattern, right? We're looking at patterns of behavior. And then the other thing is strange and the familiar. So we're looking at taking the everyday life and saying, looking at it and going, huh, that's kind of odd, right? 
we can look at this. This is 1950s, 1960s, where doctors were actually advocating smoking and very particular cigarettes. I mean, we can look at that and find that that's very odd by looking at it from today's lens. But during that time period, people weren't, that was normal, right? So part of the strangers and familiar is to make what seems normal, not so normal, or wonder about it. I was in San Francisco last year. Here, just sort of, you know, this is like, huh, what's that all about? This is about, you know, you walk across landscape and sometimes we don't stop and ask questions. This is basically to, pre to prevent uh, individuals from, from sitting. Uh, the homeless in particular, uh, to create landscapes to make sure that are uncomfortable for the homeless. This is kind of like just a funny comment. I come, you know, came across sort of idea about, about you know, suing uh, a lawsuit against McDonald's for extremely hot coffee. There's a long story to that. There's more to that story than, uh, than we're often understand. This has fascinated me, uh, you know, going to, to, um, going to Costco uh, years ago, going to buy some milk, and I saw that image and i was like huh it's like i wonder if you know actually that that organic milk comes from cows that are on this <laughs> this particular farm and i just get i just love this stuff i go huh this image you know like you don't even see a cow number one these three little chickies and it's this there's a lot of stuff that's going on in terms of that packaging that's promoting a very particular idea. And we're, what's being hidden is the reality of how that milk is being produced. Uh, and that's deliberate, that's intentional. Uh, to me, that, that kind of stuff of everyday life is super fun. And this one, is, there was a campaign, I don't know, like 10 years ago, I Love Boobies campaign. Um, I just thought it was interesting when that was going on, is like, I, you know, men have testis, testicular cancer. Uh, so why not I love I love balls and actually there are kind of campaigns for I love balls But it's like huh? That's like would people wear bracelets to say I love balls What about a female wearing a bracelet a male wearing a bracelet? Uh, what is that like? There's a lot of gender stuff that's going on within that. Um, this is potentially, you know, the, this um, I love boobies uh, It's sexualization of women reinforcement of the sexualization of women depersonalization um, there's better ways of kind of engaging a campaign of help and support and understanding for women who are undergoing breast cancer. But there's a lot of stuff that's everyday life. So we kind of like look at the everyday life, ask questions about kind of everyday life. Okay, three, theory, three theories. Okay, functionalism, conflict theory, interactionism. Okay, there's some videos I posted in the week one folder on those three theories. Watch those. This is another good one. Open up the PowerPoint. You can go there. Um, so I'm just going to go, I'm just going to go through real quick, uh, and you can go back over the theories through the videos as well. Um, the main idea here for functionalism, society is a system, it's like a biological organism. Actually Durkheim here, Durkheim developed the idea of sociology by looking at uh, knowledge in biology and developed sociology using some of the same ideas. Society has a lot of interdependent depart parts that all these parts are linked. Societies try to achieve balance and order, homeostasis. Societies are built on a value consensus. This is Martin Luther King here. And if you ever heard his I Have a Dream speech, you hear a lot of value consensus. Democracies, principles of democracies, making sure that everyone has opportunities, um, that the promissory note, that is the ideals that have been promised to African Americans and people in our society, that, it, that that's the value consensus. And that he's on the, you know, that he is at the steps uh, of the nation's capital, asking for basically that that the we uphold those values and those values are, are put into practice. Integration and regulation, making you know, the key ideas of functionalism is proper integration, the belonging, the connection. You'll read this about happiness, right? Integration, and then issues of regulation. So think about regulation as uh, direction, control. Um, influence. Um, there's right. We need to know. We have expectations. When there's like you know, floundering is lack of regulation. Overregulation would be like constrained, right? There's a proper balance between floundering and and undue restraint. Uh, so how do we regulate behavior? That becomes an important part. Anomie is sudden, ongoing change. It creates a sense of disorder. Um, 
Functionalism deals with dysfunctions. The idea is that there's a dysfunction, that society is a problem solving entity and that uh, society will solve those problems and return to a place of order. The idea of social change, the view of social change is it's gradual, it's slow and it's reformatory. So we reform institutions versus radical change. And this will be, you know, the contrast with conflict theory becomes, becomes significant. You could look at sports, youth sports, through that lens of functionalism. Sports provide a function. Sports are one of many parts, schools, fa schools family, other, you know, Bend Park and Rec District or Central Oregon Park and Bend Park and Rec District or Madras or Primeville. Um, actually, I don't know if Primeville has a park and rec, um, but places of, uh, for physical, for social socialization, right? So these are the functions of sports, leadership, developing skills and abilities, connecting, integration, learning, values, learning values that are important for society, okay? Gangs are a reflection of a dysfunction in society, right? But it's very functional. So gangs form as a dysfunction in society. So people are not getting their needs met in larger societies. So they form a subculture in order to develop a sense of connection, belonging, status, and other kind of things. One of Durkheim's studies, one of his main ones, first ones was study of suicide. And he looked at suicide away from the lens of the individual and looked at the influence of social context. So looking at integration and regulation, he applied those. If you're over or under integrated or over or under regulated, creates, prob creates a greater likelihood for suicide. So what that does is removes us, it takes us away from an individual, let's say a lens of pathology or lens of the individual is troubled to looking at what are the social forces that are going on, what are the patterns that are going on that are, that are influencing certain groups, certain demographics to be more likely to commit suicide. The more that we understand those demographics, the more we can uh, better understand how to maybe engage in changing some things to make society function better. Conflict theory. Uh, here's W. Du Bois, founder of National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, uh, Dolores Huerta, uh, who was, who, 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 her with Cesar Chavez led a revolution uh, for workers, United Farm Workers, um, addressing uh, Latinx labor in terms of farm industry. Um, here's Malcolm X, radical, advocating for significant change. And here's, of course, Karl Marx. So there are some figures of conflict theory. Um, let's not worry about this concept right now. The idea of conflict theory is to actually create change, radical change, revolutionary change to the root of society itself. Whereas functionalism, reform-minded, small change, incremental change, conflict theory, it's about radical change. So Malcolm X, critiquing capitalism, critiquing power, calling for radical change, radical change. Radical revolutionary change is built on a model of social just, justice. I like to think of the model as not radical for the sense of being an agitator, but actually conflict theory has a theory with a lot of hope and optimism in the human spirit. Marx was an optimist about the human spirit, but very pessimistic about capitalism. His view was that it's actually the social structure of the environment that's actually corrupting the individual experience and bringing harm to the individual. So we have to change the structure in order to create uh, more healthy, more vibrant, uh, more democratic institutions. Um, and you know, that's kind of the idea. I mean, the idea is that we have these principles of democracy, our idealized culture of democratic principles, that advocating that everyone has can experience those is actually very radical, right? We have a, there's a long history, for example, of voter disenfranchisement. I mean, who gets the right to vote? It wasn't until 1919 that women gained the right to vote. African Americans, you know, didn't get, gain the right to vote until, um, you know, until later. You had still have issues 1950s, 1960s in terms of different, uh, you know, the literacy tests and different things that are disenfranchising. So this idea of democracy and a voice um, you have to challenge power in order to extend democracy and those in power are not interested in more people having, uh, you know, being able to engage in democratic ideals. Uh, they would be, you know, the, the ruling class would, would, would lose out uh, if more people had 
um, true equality of opportunity. Um, so that's kind of the idea of, of, of conflict theory that, how, you know, so the working class, proletariat, the owners, bourgeoisie, Marx believed that the working class developed false consciousness, a lack of awareness of their true condition of why they're in the kind of stuck in the position they are, and that to create change, people have to develop class awareness. So that becomes important. Awareness, education, kind of key things. Immigration, this is uh, the Black Irish, a depiction of the Black Irish. The Chinese, this is 18, late 1800s. They're eating Uncle Sam. This sort of idea about immigration goes way back. Our contemporary debates about immigration go way back. A lot of false consciousness going on, a lack of awareness. A lot of people, a lot of working class individuals buy into this idea that the Chinese in this time period or the Irish are deplorable. They're criminals, they're rapists, they're gonna devour America. I mean, we can hear some of the same sentiments today. A lot of false consciousness and the importance is to develop class consciousness. Oprah, uh, years ago, she uh, was on TV and she was made a statement that, that she is not gonna eat this hamburger or something like that, I can't remember specifically. But she's made a comment about, about beef and the meat industry sued her for food libel so that she was basically, um, that she was, she unduly and unfairly criticized the beef industry. They took her to court. She actually won. But this idea, I like to use that example of freedom of speech. It's like, well, you know, freedom of speech, like, do, do we, do we have, whose interests are being protected in this case of food libel? And it was the beef industry, the beef council uh, was concerned that Oprah had a lot of influence and Oprah, if she criticized the beef industry, that, that it could change consumer behavior. So, you know, it's about power, right? Uh, this is a powerful book, Michelle Alexander, the new, Jim, the new Jim Crow, looking at the criminal justice system and policies of the criminal justice system. Mass incarceration becomes the new Jim Crow. That's about race, it's about class, um, it's about power. Um, inequality, this is kind of like, to me, like a great example. Basically, we have, there's a connection between the degree of inequality and criminality, especially violent crime. And societies that experience significant inequality have higher levels of violent crime. There's a correlation between the two. It's not cause and effect, but a correlation. One policy to minimize violent crime is to do po have policies that mitigate, address economic inequality. Um, we don't do that, right? So we focus on getting tougher on crime. Well, who's, the question from a conflict theory perspective is whose interests are served by getting tough on crime and not dealing with the underlying root of the problem, which is economic and social inequality. Um, so the evidence would say, hey, we need, to deal with the, we need to deal with the structure, right? The structure of society itself to create more equity. But to do that would basically compromise the ruling class interest, challenge their interests. The ruling class to maintain their position, they have to get the support of the majority of people in society. So a lot of false consciousness happens uh, and that becomes sort of the explanation. Okay, let's continue on. Let's see, um, cost of college, Pennsylvania 16,000. Here we go, cost of prisoner 42,000. Where, where are we gonna invest? How do we invest in human lives, right? And then finally, interactionism. Language, symbols, perceptions, meaning, self-concept, identity. This is a powerful short little video on how to be a mascots, this idea of Native Americans critiquing the idea that mascots, looking at, you know, you're looking at, at uh, Washington Redskins, I mean, recent, recent months, last year, right? Finally changing, finally changing uh, the Redskins, right? And moving away from that. That's a lot of stuff about language and meaning, right? Um, and cultural definitions. The idea of interactionism is that before we behave, before our response, we have to interpret the stimulus. So we see the Washington Redskins helmet, for example. Like our response to that is based on an interpretation. The helmet itself is a stimulus. So all these, this is, a, this is, this is an editorial cartoon. Like here's the Cleveland Indians, right? This is a mascot that we have. And this, our, this, this editorialist is saying, look, we wouldn't do this with these other social groups, right? That's stereotypical, it's dehumanizing. Um, and, but yet, you know, these are symbols that people attach meaning to. And our response to these meanings are based on interpretation. 
These interpretations come from social experiences that happen over the course of time. This is just kind of like the language of, of truck, you know, of looking at the trucking industry. Just an example, kind of move past that. I'm taking up a lot of your time, but I want to end with this here. So looking at basically sociology, the interrelationship between the individual and society, you can look at it through common sense, but it had, common sense has limitations because common sense is limited, right? Based on our own lived experience. And then also we have a lot of biases that we may carry in our common sense. Empirical, um, getting data, right? But the empirical may contradict our common sense ideas or cultural values. So empirical stuff can be very powerful. Um, sometimes people or groups delegitimize legitimize empiricism. So those who say, you know, who um, it's, a, it's important to critique science. Uh, sometimes science gets things wrong. It's important to, to critique science. But this idea of, I think, it's become politicized, uh, like climate change science. There's a, the science behind climate change is significant. The body of knowledge is significant. Um, when individuals and groups delegitimize science, they're doing that, I would argue doing that because they're, it's serving their interest to do that. Um, that empir empirical data and support, the more we understand it, can actually be very challenging and threatening to power and existing social relations. So an indiscriminate sort of disqualification of empirical data is reinforcing people's values and beliefs and, and, and biases that they have. So example I use here, they're looking at teenage pregnancy, uh, and, inequ and inequality, economic inequality. There's a relationship between the two. Um, social policies that work to minimize this are gonna minimize this at the same time. That's the data, but getting people to understand that data and then also changing social policies to uh, deal with income inequality, that's gonna be challenging tradition, challenging power. So the link between the individual and society, free will is the individual in isolation with, with individual without being influenced by outside forces. Determinism is being an individual's behavior is determined by out, outside forces. So you're, you, are, you can be whoever you wanna be. You're born poor, you can be rich. All free will, that's the free will perspective. Determinism, you're born poor, you'll stay poor. You're born rich, you'll stay rich. The reality is somewhere in between the two, we are self-determined, we are individuals who live within context. So self-determinism, this is, let's say, free will. This is determinism. The question is, how big is the egg yolk, right? So how big is determinism? How, how big is the influence of the environment? How big is the influence of the sort of the idea of the free will? That's the $60 million question, right, that we're trying to understand. Social sciences and sociology, if we're going to look at it empirically, we're going to start to be recognized that the influence of the environment is much more than we've ever recognized. Our culture in the United States facilitates a focus on individualism, uh, rugged individualism. So what that does, it minimizes our exposure and analysis of uh, the influence of the social context and social forces. So this class is going to move us in the direction of thinking about social forces and human behavior. Uh, and this last slide, basically they're using this fishbowl kind of idea that, yeah, this fish can make it. So therefore, that fish made it, can all make it. Well, you know, did that fish make it because it worked harder than others? Well, I would say, well, that, you know, if that was the case, that there's a lot of social learning that went on, reinforcement, supports, opportunities, things that went on that influenced and shaped why that fish was able to get out. I'd be interested in the patterns of the fishes. Like if we had a lot of different bowls, a lot of, you know, what are the patterns uh, versus individual motivation alone? Um, there's different bowl, bowls for different types of fish. We can kind of go there and say, well, there's a lot of different kinds of bowls, right? Race is a bowl. The, you know, a person's color of their skin, physical features are a bowl. We all live in different bowls, right? So we can't just compare one fish jumping out. We got to be able to understand the bowls that we're living in. There's different water in the bowls, right? So we kind of continue on with that. Uh, for certain individuals live in bowls that really facilitate a lot of development. Other people live in bowls that uh, make it very challenging to move forward in society itself. So that's kind of the idea, um, is to understand the social world, understand our experience in the social world um, through that, the lens of sociology. All right.
well, that's it. If you have any questions, let me know. Rock on. Um, yeah, if you're, if, you're, if you're struggling this first week of the term, um, clarification, get it from me. I can provide it, you know, sometimes a quick phone call. Um, reach out to me. Let me know. Best wishes to you. Have a great week. Be safe. Be well. Take care.